What's up, Force Nation? This is Major Passens and Matt Hannafin, and we are going to be doing a new podcast called The Force with Matt and Major. So we're going to be talking about the latest in the Sky Force world um, with two ways, new signings, games, hopefully some interviews with players and staff. And we're just going to bring you all the latest in the Sky Force world. So Matt, thanks for joining us today. Um, let's get this started. So first and foremost, how excited are you to do the pod? Are you asking like on a scale of one to 10? Yeah, let's do one to 10. One to 10, 11. 11, there you go. That's outside the range, but we'll accept it. Yeah. All right, so we're going to jump right in. So the Sky Force have a long history of getting, you know, players to the NBA and getting new contracts, um, two ways as well as standards. I mean, the Heat specifically, it is the Heat's G League team. And the Heat have several players that started on the Sky Force on their team currently. What do you think makes them be able to get so many of these call-ups? Well, I mean, like, we look at it from years past. And when I say years past, I mean, like, the last five years, how good of a recent track record they have of developing some of these guys. Like, you have a guy like Duncan Robinson in your system for for a year. He's an undrafted player. Um, he, he develops a, a better skill set at the G League level, and then he gets called up, I believe it was towards the uh, end of the season in 2019. Um, he has a cup of coffee there, but then he all of a sudden blossoms in Jimmy's first year in 2020, and then um, so on and so forth. And now we see how, he, how he's playing now with the current team just a few seasons later. Um, they've had a track record of developing these guys, like, like just not, not even relate, like not even specifically to the sky force, but like Max Struess and Gabe Vincent, for example, like we've seen what they can do when they, when they foster these guys and nurture these guys, you pluck them from different organizations. Max Struess spent time in Chicago and in Boston. Gabe Vincent was most notably in Sacramento. Um, they joined their systems. They're there for a while. They, they develop them. They nurture their talent. They, they try to do whatever they can, and all of a sudden they blossom. And guess what? Now they earn these multi-million dollar contracts. And so I think with the Heat's developmental system, and just not even only that, but like finding the guys who who want to buy in, right? Like you 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 want to you want to obviously find guys as an organization who who you know will buy in, who will be unselfish, be be selfless individuals who will want to develop whatever skill set they need to to better their NBA careers. And like, yeah, it's easy to say that all of these guys, they yeah, they obviously want to become NBA players, but not all of them, not all of them have the same mindset, right? Um, you and I have talked about this uh, on our spaces on, we, we're recording this on March 6th. We've had a spaces on Sunday talking about this a little bit more, but like guys don't necessarily have the mindset of being an NBA player, let alone um, developing themselves as an NBA player. Like they don't, they they don't have the mind they don't have the proper mindset, and so if you're able to find guys with that proper mindset and then foster their talent and nurture it and develop it, you're in a good spot because you see guys like Drew Peterson get plucked even though he was with the team for only a few months or in the organization for only a few months. He's a rookie. Mm-hmm. Um, Justin Champagne, um, he gets plucked by the Washington Wizards and now he's on a two-way contract. He just signed it after his first ten day. Alondis Williams, who thankfully is staying with the organization, but he's been one of the best G League players in the entire um, the entire year after spending last year with Brooklyn. But you've seen like he didn't even get a whole lot of time in the, in in the summer league, and he was like, okay, like what's going on here? But then all of a sudden he blossoms because he's developing, he's because he's buying in. Jamari Bouye, who um, has spent time with, with Miami for the last two last two seasons for the most part, um, had a had a brief stint in Portland. A couple, or at least a couple brief stints in Portland, um, and then just got recently signed a two-way contract with the San Antonio Spurs. Like those guys bought in, they developed. Yeah, they were probably the best players on the team. No, no duh. There's a reason why they're on two-way contracts and getting ten days and stuff like that. But they're, but they're willing to buy in, and they're willing to develop their skill set because you can be a twenty-point per game scorer in college, and have a completely different role at the next level because of whether it's your physical traits, whether it's because of the fit of the team, whether they think that's the best fit. Why? Like all of these guys are the are in the top 5 percentile, top 10 percentile of athletes across the world, but not all of the teams and not all of the organizations have the same need. And if they see something in you, whether it's at the college level, whether it's like a, 
I don't know, high school, if they even go back that far, um, or even like in summer league with some of these guys getting plucked from Exhibit 10 contracts. There's a role for you. So there's a role for every player somewhere. It's just a matter of an organization finding it, developing it, and the Miami Heat organization has been as good as anyone at doing that over the last several years. And I'm not. I'm just pointing out those guys because those guys have recently signed contracts. Um, you see, we're probably going to get into a little bit later, but like you see guys like Olin Carter, um, who is developed, who's been around the G League block a little bit. He's been with the the Austin Spurs to Texas Legends. He got plugged from the. Uh, they, I think they traded for him from the Cleveland Charge yes. um, earlier mm-hmm. er, earlier this year. Um, Caleb Daniels, who is also a rookie, who kind of came in with Peterson, showed a little bit of it in summer league, but he's now developing a better skill set. He's getting more run. Um, and you see like the potential that he has, like Orlando Robinson, who was um, a rookie last year, um, was on a two-way contract. And now he, I mean, he, he's the backup center or the third, whatever word you want to call it. He, he, he parlayed his way into a standard contract this year. Um, for one of the best teams in the East, a top five, top six team. Like, there's there's ways that you can develop yourself. And, yeah, it takes time. It's frustrating for players because it's like, yeah, you want to play at the NBA level. You want to showcase what you got. But, like, sometimes you got to go through some rough patches. Sometimes you got to you you got to take some lumps um, to, to, to get to where you want to go. Yeah, yeah. I, one of the things specifically that you said is, like, you know, they have someone that is a 20 point per game scorer in college. Like not everyone's going to be like that at the pro level. And I think the Sky Force specifically do a really good job at like not making sure people know that, but like giving everyone roles, right? Like Bouye, for example, you know, last year he was leading scorer. He was scoring a ton. Um, he had the ball in his hands a lot, making all of the decisions this year with a lot of the talent they have. And I mean, you just named four players that were on two ways that weren't on two ways at the start of the year. So that's the crazy thing. Um, so they have, you know, seven two way capable players on their team at one time. So they have so much talent that not everyone's going to do the exact role that they would like to do or that they think they should do, but they did a good job of making sure everyone bought into that for the betterment of the team. And yes, it did take some time for them to figure it out. This showcase portion of the season admittedly did not go as good as it probably should have, especially looking back. But I mean, start of the regular season, they started out nine and zero and were just absolutely blasting teams. Like, and then all their players start getting poached. And as the G League does, um, it's probably the hardest basketball league to win in because one week you can have, you know, seven two way you know, level players. And then the next week they're all gone like, and you're just stuck with the three on your team. So you just lost four of your best players and you have to scramble and figure it out. That's kind of like the beauty and the curse of the G league. But that's why I think this is so important. Why we start out the podcast talking about this is because they routinely do this. They have always found a way to develop the guys. I mean, Olin Carter, like you're saying, he just, started bombing threes in their most recent game and he hadn't quite shown that in the past couple but now he has a better opportunity and they had him you know get ready stay ready type thing Caleb Daniel started out the season not as big of a uh, like focal point of the team but now he's one of the best players on the team and he's relied on to do a lot and like you're saying Alondis no one was thinking he would be you know, in the Rising Stars NBA All-Star Weekend playing for the Team G League and he would be a G League All-Star. No one was quite thinking about that. Next thing you know, you got Heat fans and NBA Twitter saying, oh my gosh, the Heat have done it again after he's scoring on, you know, Victor Wimbayana. And it's just crazy. Like they just keep finding these players and they keep developing them. They don't let them hijack the team. And I think that's comes down from the heat, right? They're the heat G league team, the heat. If you don't ride with them, you know, get out. And the sky force are that same way. If you're not willing to do your role, it's kind of, you know, get out. We'll get someone else that's willing to do their role. And that's willing to put in the work. And even when they don't like it or think they want more, they're willing to still do the work and do what's best for the team. And it produces results, not only for the team, but also for the individual players. Like, NBA teams aren't looking for a 
guy to take 25 shots when they're looking at G League players. They're typically looking for players to fill a role when they're calling them up, right? And some potential goes into that as well of, oh, we think this guy can be good, so we're going to call him up and secure him so no one else can get him. But to get minutes short term, they're not looking for a guy, oh, we're going to put you in and you're going to be the focal point of our NBA offense. No, we're going to put you in and we want you to do this specific thing. And it seems like the Sky Force really understand that and they do a good job of molding their players to be, for lack of a better term, role players at the next level and to fill that role. And like you mentioned with Orlando Robinson, he's maybe the third string center for the Heat right now. Um, depending on who you ask, could be two, you know? Yeah, that's you know? why I tried um, to, yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's up in there. But like for any player in the G League, they would kill for that, right? To just be on a roster. That's, you made it, right? People want to clown the guy for being, you know, third string, not really getting any minutes. But he's already made it. He's signed a standard contract in the NBA. That's all these guys' goals, and he's did it. And, you know, he's been successful at what he does. So I think it's a, it's a culture thing and understanding and not letting people take over, um, like, the, the team and the offense and being like, no, we, we play team basketball here. And I think NBA teams like that as well. And the, just a few other guys that I want to mention who I didn't mention before. Um one of them being, I mean, I know he's not hes not on the Heat anymore. I know most Heat fans probably don't like him. Um, but Omer Yurtsev, he was signed the last day of the regular season, I believe, in 22. Or no, it was 21. Um, one of those two years. I, my memory's fogging me a little bit. But um, he spent time in the, I believe it was in the Oklahoma City organization. Correct me if I'm wrong there. Um, but he, 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 signed with, he signed with Miami. Um, they developed him. He wasn't like necessarily a starter or anything, but he was certainly a better player than what he was um, beforehand. I mean, like, and he got some, obviously there was some injuries, then he got s- some playing time and some PT there. And now he's, he signed a contract with Utah, a minimum contract with Utah um, earlier this season. But like, he was another guy who not really many people heard of. He got plucked from a different organization. Obviously, the results are a little bit different. Like, it didn't necessarily work out, um, but it worked out to some extent in terms of, like, okay, they developed this guy. He got brought to the NBA level. A lot of fans were wanting him to start. He gets hurt with a back injury, um, and it kind of – it was just kind of a slippery slope from there. Um, And then Drew Smith, who Mm -hmm. has been with the Sky Force each of the last two seasons for the most part. Um, he was a guy who, like, if you watch summer league, a lot of heat. Fan, I don't know if many heat fans liked him because of just the decision making and the indecision and stuff like that. Um, but he was a guy who bought into his role. Um, he, what, no matter what you say about him as a player, he was a great defender, a guy who you could put at the point of attack and at least disrupt things for a little bit. Um, and he he didn't try to do every he didn't ever try to do too much when he was on the floor, in my opinion, at least. Um, and then you exactly. saw that he gets. He earns that final standard spot. Um, unfortunately, he gets hurt in Cleveland in November, and his season's over. And now he just got weight uh, for Patty Mills. Um, but he was a guy who um, he he earned his way, and he had to. He again, he went through some lumps. He went through some 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 hard times, and he's going through one right now again with the knee injury, unfortunate knee injury because of a court. Um, but he was a guy who earned his way, and then another one who he wasn't like drafted to be um he, he wasn't th- this guy i'm gonna mention it wasn't drafted to be a guy who you develop like he he wasn't like an undrafted guy but but nikola jovich he was a guy who spent time in the G- like he he was up and down his first season in miami and it was more so because it was hard to find playing time for him and you just want and you want to get give these guys reps like especially a guy like jovich who um was your first round pick like you want to get him some reps i know he got injured he 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 injured his back his his season was a little bit rocky but he's the definition of a guy who bought in because like if you look at how skinny he was when he first came up came into the league and then you look at him even like months later like april may of last year this dude's like jacked like (laughs) This guy's a guy who completely bought into like what they were like, yo, you got to do this. You got to do A, B, and C. Um, 
and even Spose talked about it before how he went through some lumps in the G League. Like the G League with him in the Sky Force wasn't always perfect. Um, he went through like there was some definitely time where he struggled. Um, and he was able to to persevere. He has a, what Spo calls a competitive spirit. Um, and guess what? Now he's starting for the Miami Heat, and he might not relinquish that starter spot heading into the postseason. Like he's a guy who, again, we were excited about. I'm saying we like Heat Heat fans were excited about. Um, doesn't get a whole doesn't get a whole lot of touches in his first G League start or his first G League or not G League his first summer league stint. Has an up and again an up and down rookie season suffers an injury. Um, doesn't get too much run either at the NBA level. He played like less than 10 games or something like that. And then at the G League level, um, he developed, he, he continued working at his craft. And guess what? Now he's on an NBA roster and he's now starting. He's a starting NBA forward. Like it's not always, it's it, the growth isn't always linear with this stuff. Yeah, and I'm glad you actually mentioned Jovic because I was just about to mention him. Of even a guy that was a first round draft pick, right? Um, that was lots of potential, but very raw. And like you mentioned last year, he was kind of up and down. Even at the beginning of this year, he was sent up and down a lot too before he kind of solidified himself in that rotation, um, as we think he has. But the difference between his game when he would go down to the G League, then come back up was astronomical and also when he went down to the g league they didn't stop running the offense and just let jovich do whatever he wanted he played a role on that team and i think that kind of goes back to what we were talking about of like they have a good culture and they have a good presence of mind to where they don't let guys hijack their offense and they don't let guys dictate how they're going to play they dictate how the players are going to play similar to how a lot of coaches in the nba do for role players Obviously, for star players like, you know, the Jimmy Butlers and LeBron Jameses and the Lucas, they have more freedom. But we're not talking about those guys, right? Like we're talking about the plug and play starters or the role players. They're more dictated on what they do because they're brought for a specific role. And Jovic played a specific role at the Sky Force. I mean, he was probably by far the most talented guy on the court. And he's not the focal point, oh, Jovic, you can take every shot or anything. It's like, hey, no, we need you to do this. We need you to run the offense, kind of play point guard. And ironically, that's kind of the role, even though he's like the starting four. He's having the ball in his hands a lot and pushing pace and doing stuff like that for the Heat. And so that just shows their development on even guys that were first-round draft picks and not really G League-type players, undrafted guys and, you know, growth is not only for guys that people didn't think could be anything it's for everyone right everyone whether you're the number one overall pick or you know you're undrafted and no one's even heard your name before you still got to grow and improve and the sky force have done that with first round draft picks to undrafted people and they're not just letting them dictate how the game's being played they're still making them play basketball and you're seeing the fruits of that at the NBA level currently, not only with the Heat, but as you mentioned, with several other teams as well across the NBA. So we've talked about people getting contracts and you know all that with it and how they develop players and everything. So who do we think is going to be up next and kind of fill that void? Not necessarily like next person to get a two-way, but kind of who can step up and be one of those best players on the team now? Um, I mean, Caleb Daniels comes to mind just because of the, of the tear that he was on. Um, he was averaging, I mean, really, it, it really was mid February where he kind of took off a little bit. Um, just with like his usage and his production. Um, he's get, I think he's getting to the rim a lot more. Um, he's averaging 13 points per game on the season, but since February 13th, he's averaging 20 points per game on 35% shooting from deep. He was a little bit of an inconsistent three point shooter in college. Um, and he was a guy who I think played like five or six years. I can't remember off the top of my head, but he was a guy who played in college for a while. Um, and now he, you, I mean, he's still, he, there's some times where he's still a little bit of inefficient from deep, but like he's getting to the rim or he's using that physical bruising nature that we saw from him and that we expected from him um, in summer. And 
he's definitely a guy like I don't know if he's going to be the next guy to get a two way, but I think he's a guy that they like and they think. I mean, I'm not. I'm saying this unsourced. You have more sources than me. I have more sources than a tomato. Um, but he's <laughs> he's a guy who. I think can I think the Heat do like and will want to keep in their system. Um, I'm, again, that's spec, more spectacle than anything. I, again, I have zero sources. Um, and then Olin Carter, a guy who again who I mentioned earlier, who they acquired in February, is another one. Like we just saw Tuesday um, against Oklahoma City. Like he he gets 39 minutes. He I think it was 24 points, six threes. Like his usage, I feel like went up. He's a good catch and shoot shooter. He's shown that. Um, or, I mean, I guess it's a little bit inconsistent, but, like, he's he's a capable catch-and-shoot shooter. And he's shown that throughout his multiple stops, throughout his young professional career. Um, he can do a little bit on the ball. Um, he's another guy who, like, who has a quick first step, kind of like Jamari. Um, he He's a little bit crafty, like, with what he can do with inside the arc, with, like, his, his post work and um, his, his shot diet there. Uh, but he's mainly a guy who, I mean, he's got a quick release, like, if you kickouts whatever the case is like he'll he'll spray it like he, he he's definitely one where i'm keeping my eye on especially with alondis getting um this two-way spot and him may not being at the g league level as often like he was with the g league level yesterday or he was with the g league team yesterday um and he, he again he did alondis williams things but like if alondis isn't there these are the two guys that i'm mainly looking out for to, to kind of up their production. Like Malik Williams has been awesome lately, especially on the glass. He's grabbing like, I don't know, 700 rebounds a game. <laughs> um, yeah, he's dominating. He's been an animal <laughs> there. Yeah. I've never seen anyone dominate boards like that, um, especially at the G League level. Like, I don't know, maybe I've just missed something, but he was on a streak of like seven straight games of 17 rebounds or something ridiculous like that. I saw that and I was like, that's not possible. Um, he was going to be one of my guys. So I'm glad you mentioned him. Malik Williams, I think he can really step it up. I mean, when you're grabbing 17 rebounds for an extended period of time, you're going to have a lot of opportunities to make an impact on the game. He's also shown that he can step out and shoot the three a little bit. So I think, you know, he has a lot of potential there. He has a smooth stroke. So if he does a little bit more consistently hitting a high volume of threes, especially, and then also battles on the boards. That's like a perfect modern day five, right? Um, he's not a huge body either. He's tall, but he's not, you know, like big. He's more on the skinny side for a tall center, especially for a guy that rebounds at that level. So I think he has a lot of potential. He's, you know, pretty decently athletic. So I think he can step up. He'll be more of a focal point. Another guy that I want to mention, and I've kind of talked about him in the past on you know Twitter and other videos, is going to be Josh Christopher. I mean, we're talking about former first round pick, you know, a lot of talent there. Smooth bucket getter can get you a bucket in pretty much any way. And at the Salt Lake City Stars, he was like the focal point of the offense. He had the ball in his hands a lot, and he was putting up massive numbers. So now he might have a little bit of an opportunity to go back to that, and so we might see him skyrocket his numbers and you know kind of show the world what he can do so he would be someone i would look out for as long as malik williams and then two guys i want to mention that you know might not make a big difference as in like starter or star but are going to make a difference in the margins i think at least definitely have a potential to and anyone that has ever listened to me talk about the sky force knows who i'm about to say right here is manny camper i love that man so much he is like the classic glue guy. He will do literally anything the team needs for him. It, he will just play defense and never touch the ball on offense if he has to. He will be that physical guy on the offensive end if that's what the team needs him to do right then. He's just the ultimate, I just want to win, I don't care guy. And I mean, he's told me that, so I'm not even spec, you know, speculating there. He's straight up said, I just want to win, like, I'm willing to do whatever it takes to win. And he wants to show that he can do a little bit more as well. And I think we've been seeing that a little bit. I'm not saying he's ever going to have huge, massive, like a 30-point game or anything like that. But a small intake in his minutes and his numbers, I think, are actually going to make a big difference on this team um, as we move forward. And then the second guy that I would like to see get a little bit more opportunity is going to be Bryson Warren. 
I don't know if anyone has improved more from the start of the season to the end of the season as Bryson Warren. I mean, I know he's a gym rat. He constantly is working in the gym, trying to improve his game. I mean, he was a former five-star guard, sophomore, Mr. Arkansas at in high school and had offers from Auburn and other places and chose to go to overtime elite. And his name kind of dwindled from there. So he's, sole reason he's in the G League is just to try to become the best basketball player he can be, even though he knew he wasn't going to get as much playing time. And I love that mindset from him. So I think if he gets a little bit more minutes, he can show, I mean, he's a flat out shooter. And I think that's part of the reason why he could really show if he gets hot from three for an extended period of time, we all know the modern, you know, NBA and G League and basketball, you put up points in a hurry, it's kind of hard to stop. So another thing we're going to talk about today is the strengths and weaknesses of the team. I, we, we keep alluding to offense when we talk about these guys. So I don't think it's going to be like a secret what our strengths are. Mine's going to be shooting. Like the Sky Force have tons of capable shooters and they never lack shooting. Um, even Alondez Williams, who I said at the start of the season was his biggest weakness. Uh, he's been hitting them at a pretty high clip and has shown he can make the open ones. I'm not saying he's going to be like Steph Curry and take on three defenders and fade away threes, but if you you can't leave him open, he's going to hit those shots. Olin Carter, like you're saying, just hit six threes in a game. Bryson Warren, like I just talked about. Um, Caleb Daniels, Malik Williams. Just the list goes on of guys that you can't leave open, and that adds a massive dynamic to this team of someone gets past their man Will you send any bit of help defense? And you got four other guys on the court that can let it fly from three. And that just makes them really hard to guard. And we see that as they constantly put up massive offensive numbers. Um, so, Matt, what do you think their biggest strength is? Um, I, I mean, obviously, the like as we talked about, we're probably going to be leaning more towards the offensive side of the ball. Um, but rebounding. I think rebounding was something that, like, they're one of the best offensive rebounding teams in the league. Um, Orlando Robinson. Malik Williams, um, Justin Champagne, um, even though he's somewhere else, Jamal Kane, who's been kind of up, up and down with the uh, with the organization. But like those guys are all very capable offensive rebounders. Um, I think they're top ten in the league in rebounding percentage, and I believe they're top five or close to top five in offensive rebounding percentage. Like these are guys who hit the glass hard, and that's kind of the antithesis of what we see from at the NBA level with this team because they usually prioritize hey, getting back in transition, like. They, they don't really attack the offensive glass that much other than like Haywood Highsmith and like a few other guys, but like at the G league level, it's a little bit different. And obviously we've seen even with like with what Jamal can do um, at the NBA level. And he's, and he's very instinctual. Um, I really, all of these guys are really instinctual with what they can do on the offensive glass. Like they're smart basketball players. They put themselves in the right positioning. And then they also have just the effort and like rebounding is majority. The majority of rebounding is effort. Um, and I think this is what they're capable of doing. Something else I want to bring up on the offensive end, though, is maybe not the biggest strength anymore because of who's left, but rim pressure. Um, like guys like Jamari Bouye was able to get to the rim. Alondis Williams got to the rim. Um, again, he's, he can still play with the team technically, but I don't anticipate him being there that often. Um, I'm just saying that out of speculation. Um, Champagne can get to the rim. Like these guys, like especially with Alondis and with Jamari, like they're crafty with their handle. Um, Jamari has an explosive first step. And so like he was able, like whether it was off the catch or off the bounce, like he he was able to get to the rim at will sometimes and bend defenses that way. Um, but they, then even yet guys like Caleb Daniels, who can who can potentially uh, flash in that department, who I talked about earlier. He's more of like a physical, physical guard, but he's a guy who can get to the rim. Like if you can generate those paint touches, well, that's the most fashionable form of offense. So um, whether you're kicking out, whether you're shooting like, these guys, some of these guys can't get to them. Like Josh Christopher is a guy who can get to the, um, like they're, they're they have that skill set, and I think that's helped their offense out a lot. I mean, like you mentioned the shooting. Sometimes when you have like a Cole Swider on like a strong side or whatnot, well, guess what? I, they're gonna stick to Cole Swider, and if they play off Cole Swider, you can just hit him for the three. But like, I could, I have that, that lane's that much more open for me, and so I can attack that lane and get to the rim a little bit easier than I would be if it was a non-shooter space in that corner. And so I think it goes, kind of goes hand-in-hand hand with each other. Obviously, you need the athletes 
um, to be able to get to the rim. Um, and then obviously you need the shooters to be able to shoot. And so they, I think the Sky Force, again, go back to what we were talking about at the beginning, they found guys who um, know how to buy in and have the skill set that they want them to have. Um, and they've done a good job of developing these guys. And like, again, this is one of the best offensive teams in the league, even with that kind of, after that 9-0 stretch, um, they were still top five, top 10 in that in that area. And they've maintained that sense. Um, and so I think it kind of goes hand in hand with each other. We may see a little, I don't know how much of a dip we'll see, but we may see a little bit of a dip. The less we see of a line is plus without Champagne um, and Bouye over time. But uh, this is one of the better offensive teams in the G League. And I, I again, that's where we're kind of leaning with this in terms of strength. But I think there's some other important aspects to note about. And the last thing I want to talk about is clutch games. They're awesome in clutch games. And if you're a Heat fan, you hear the word clutch games, you kind of shrivel up um, based off what happened last year uh, with the team. But this team has been awesome in clutch game. It's just an in part because of like a guy like Alondis Williams who was able to get you a bucket at any point in time. Um, and Jamari Bouye and stuff like that. Like this team, I think 10 and five in clutch games, they have the third best clutch net rating in the entire league. Um, it, listen, if it, the, the 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 apple doesn't far fall from the the apple does not fall far from the tree when it comes to the clutch game aspect. So it's just another thing I want to point out, even though it's kind of meaningless and it's such a small sample, but uh, or not I guess not meaningless, but it's a small sample and kind of random, but something they're good at. So may as well point it out. <laughs> yeah, and like kind of what you're talking about is some of those players that we're really good at some of those things we just mentioned are gone now. So we do have a little bit that we need to wait and see before we make definitive answers on this Skyforce team, how they are now. But I'm not worried remotely about the offense. Like there's still a bunch of offensive guys. And yes, it might change a little bit on how it is done and how it's presented and how it looks. But the overall results, they're still going to put up points. Like, I, I don't think that'll ever be a concern for the Sky Force. Now, what is a big concern to me is the other side of the ball and who I constantly just keep saying is abysmal and needs to work on it is everyone on the Sky Force at times, right? They are terrible at defense at times. And as, as much as they effort they put onto the offensive end, they just don't on the defensive end at some times. What are your thoughts on their defense? Um, I think, I mean, I, I just talked about the rim pressure offensively, but like one of the biggest flaws of this team defensively is their, their lack of stopping dribble penetration. Um, they are amongst the top 10 in the league in shots allowed at the rim, um, and field goal makes at the rim, even though their percentages are pretty good. If like, if you, if you dig deeper into the numbers, like their percentages, when they're defending the room, when they're within five to eight feet, like they're, they're fairly good, but you still want to prevent guys to get those paint touches because again, that, that can allow to kick outs that can allow to, to, to draw in fouls. Like that can, that can allow to a lot of things. And you're at a disadvantage, disadvantageous position as a defense. If you're allowing that many paint touches, allowing that many attempts at the rim, even if there's not as many makes like, you 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 have to you have to kind of harden your core at the point of attack a little bit, and that's also something that the NBA team has had a hard time of doing. Um, definitely at certain points over the last, not even just this season, but few seasons. But I think their point of attack and them, like obviously, like a guy like Jamal Kane's really good at the point of attack with his length, with his foot speed, with his dexterity, and him being able to create deflections. The same thing with the Jamari Bouye, who's now recently departed. But um, just in general, from a team aspect, I think shoring up what you can do at the point of attack, making sure you're preventing teams from getting into the lane um, is such a huge part of why they're a middle of the pack defense. Um, and it, on it, like it could be better, even though they are 17 and eight, like they are, I think 13th or 14th defensive rating. It's not like the worst, worst, worst in the world, but like when you can't get stops at certain moments, especially, I mean, it, it, to a fault, like, I I would kind of expect G League players to not be as good defensively because like they're they are still a little bit raw with their skill set um to like to some extent but like you still want to you you still 
want to get stops. Like some of these guys aren't good defenders, but you need team defense um, in order to win these games. Uh, even though your biggest priority is developing these guys, well, guess what the Heat try to develop? They try to develop guys who can defend. And if you can't defend, you're probably not going to be playing a whole lot in their organization, or especially with the with the NBA team. And so if you're if you can defend or if you have like a really defined skill set on that end, like you're gonna play. And there's not a whole lot of guys on this team who who do that now, even though they can develop that over time. It's not impossible. It's not like they have a lot of negative, negative defenders, but it's just from like a team defensive aspect. Again, I'm not expecting all of these guys to be polished defenders because if they're polished defenders, they'd probably be first round picks or they'd probably be at the NBA level. That's just not the case right now. You gotta develop that. And that's something that I think they 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 have to improve on um, as the season as the end of the season approaches. Yeah, and like I don't think their numbers really show how bad they are at times. And usually we say that the opposite: the numbers don't show how good they are at times. But when they first started the regular season, they were actually like incredible on defense. And then it's kind of trickled off, and then it came back for a little bit, came back for a couple of games, and now it's trickled off again. And I know sometimes they play real fast, and so they'll put up a lot of points, and other teams will put up a lot of points as well. Um, so it can look worse in certain games, and it, and it is kind of game by game too. It's like sometimes they decide, hey, we're not playing defense today. And some of it is their scheme. I know Coach Powell lets them gamble for a lot of steals, but does try to put a leash on them and try to say, hey, you know, don't just go for everything. If you're going to put the defense in a bad spot, don't. But I think a lot of the guys are just here, yeah, let's go for steals. And so they do get a lot of steals in a lot of games, but then certain times it backfires. And I think like a perfect example of this is they dropped 122 or 120 points in their last game, sorry. And they lost by nine. They let up 129 points in a game. And there's, in my mind, no excuse for that. Like, I don't care if the other team's on fire. I don't care um, if you're playing really fast. So, it, you know, it's not looking as bad because there was a ton of possessions. Like, you got to find a way to win a game when you score 120 points. Like, to me, that's just the thing. And it takes some personal pride and some personal effort. Not saying that these guys don't have any of it and that they don't want to play good defense. I know they want to. It's just sometimes when you watch, like, ah, oh, that effort could have been a little bit better. You could have fought for that rebound a little bit more. You could have you know, fought for an extra step or two, like you said, at the um, point of attack because they're getting blown by certain times. It's just a bunch of little things that add up to points over time. And so it's definitely fixable because this team has fixed it two or three times this season. But at the same time, you shouldn't have to fix something like that multiple times in a season. So I think they have a lot of potential. They'll continue to put up a bunch of points, but that defensive end could really hold them back in the later stages of this season and re hold them back from reaching their full potential even and kind of leaving us disappointed after this great season when it's all said and done because they might be scoring 115 but they could let up 120 or 129 but you just gotta find a way to win those games if you're on fire on offense you should let that at minimum ignite your defense right they don't do that at times they'll do it to claw back into a game and then fall back in those same patterns so they show it's there even in the course of the game, but we haven't seen it for a full four quarters yet. And I think Coach Powell will pull that out in them, going back to what we first talked about, their culture, their you know willingness to develop players. They'll continue working on the guys and making sure they're in the right spots and doing what they need to do. So I'm not too worried about it in the grand scheme of everything. I think they'll be able to figure it out. But it is concerning just looking at the numbers and watching them play. It's like, hey, this is not the best y'all can play right now. And I think that's real frustrating to me, too, is I want the guys to be playing as best as they can for as a team and as individual players. Because, you know, NBA, you're talking about you just want the team to win. But the reality of the G League is I want these players to do well because I want to see them progress and them maybe achieve their dreams of playing in the NBA. So it's that weird thing of, you know, it's not all about wins in the G League, which I know sounds really weird to say about a professional sport, but it's about developing the players and being the best team you can be at the end of the year and um, being the best player you can be at the end of the year. So there's a lot of interesting dynamics here, and I think that defense is 
the number one on the list of what a lot of these guys need to improve to make that next step. Agreed. And one other thing that I wanted to point out, um, again, we talked about the offense being a strength, but like it's something that I, I just kind of like flagged was turnovers. Um, and specifically like the assist turnovers, like, again, I'm not expecting everyone to be incredibly polished playmakers again. Like some guys are, are fitting into new roles that they weren't accustomed to at previous levels. And so I think there is um, some, some room for error when that's the case. Um, but they are bottom 10 in the league in uh, turnover percentage. Um, they are like bottom six, seven teams in assist turnover. Again, like not something I'm worried about, not something that like I'm like going crazy about, but just like if we're talking about weaknesses of a, of a team, um, I would say that's one of them. Even if you contextualize it a little bit more, again, some of these guys are probably playing out of their roles. Again, guys are guys are getting new skill sets. Guys are playing at a faster pace. And so, it, again, there's there's room for error for not just the guys on the Sky Force, but every single G League team who has these new up and coming guys. And so that's just something I, I flagged. Nothing, nothing crazy, nothing like catastrophic, but um, something that I just kind of, you know, put in the back of your mind a little bit, especially now that they're going to be without Jamari, who is one of their best decision makers, um, and Alondis for, again, we don't know how long, how much he's going to play the rest of the season. Um, and so there, you could be without two of your lead ball handlers for the majority of the rest of the season, in addition to Jamal Kane, in addition to um, Champagne, who got poached a couple of weeks ago. Like some of these guys who have the highest usage or among the, amongst the highest usage are now going to be gone. So guys are going to be filling in the new gaps and new spots. And I'm just interested to see how that progresses itself. Yeah, and it's kind of interesting that a team that is good at gambling at steals and does it so frequently gets bit by the same thing on the offensive end. And we've kind of mentioned that a couple of times of things are good on offense. They're actually bad at on defense, which I always think is funny to look at. Of You think if that's something as your strength, you would know how to stop it. But that unfortunately is not the case. So in closing here today, they play the Salt Lake City Stars on March 10th at 3 p.m. Do you think they get the dub? Considering they would have what five days rest, four days rest, yes, I think they do, especially in their it's at home, right? Yes, yep, so five days rest at home against the Salt Lake City Stars, yeah, and I think Salt Lake's been, been better lately, but uh, yeah, I think they get the win as well. Where's the longest when really... you need him, man? Can you go off for 50 again against them? Oh my gosh, if he goes for 55 against the Salt Lake City Stars game, I will lose my mind. <laughs> yeah, get, uh, let's get him to 60 this time. Let's get him to yeah. 60 this time. 55 is chump change now. It's 60. We need that 60 ball. The the fact that they were down by almost 30 points in that game too. Yeah, like what is like 26 Josh, points. Yeah, Josh Christopher was on the Salt Lake City Stars then and right. uh Little known fact, he was dominating that game. And I was talking to him and I was like, Yeah, he started seven for seven from three. And I've never seen someone correct me so fast in their life. He before I even finished the sentence, it was eight for eight. I was like, Okay, sorry. <laughs> he wanted me to know he was cooking. Yeah, he wanted me to know. But all right, with that, I think we that is all we are gonna talk about today. So thank everyone for listening. If you're a Heat fan, if You've never even heard of us. If you've never even watched a Sky Force game, you know where to find the next one. Um, March 10th, you can watch it at nbagleague.com or the Bally Sports app. And once again, thank you all for listening. My name is Major Passens, and Matt Hannafin is with me, and we'll see you all next time.